Okay, so welcome, welcome, one and all. Um, I'm just going to talk a little about some palliative care topics as part of your 18-month uh, rotating curriculum. So if you're only here for nine more months, you're going to miss out on a lot of great talks. So <laughs> stick around, see what you think. Um, so we're going to talk, it's going to be kind of fun. We'll take a, a few different topics here. Uh, a lot of sort of introductory, a little bit of history, kind of know where you are, a little bit of indications of when to consult, when not, or really when to, of course. Um, and then there'll be subsequent talks on some specific symptom management syndromes as well. So, you know, if you read as much as I do, I go to Stedman's, and that'd be probably Wikipedia, right? So, uh, so this is just from, you look at just palliative care as, as a definition. So as a specialty, it's only been around since probably about, probably 1997, 1998, so only about 20 years. So fairly, um, fairly uh, immature, I guess, to speak. Uh, but a lot of action in a short period of time as far as penetration, et cetera. But if you look at palliative care, it's a different, people say, you know, what do you do? What do you do? They get nervous. They say, oh, palliative care, you're going to kill me. Um, I say, I could, but I won't. Um, so we talked about it. We want to mitigate symptoms. We want to reduce the severity, alleviate symptoms. Um, I'd love to cure if I could, but most of us are all internists. You guys have chose professions. You don't really cure anything. Sorry. You may not have signed up for that. Maybe a bursitis, so learn how to inject the joint, okay? You make patients very happy. Uh, so we usually can't cure it, but we're trying to manage the symptoms and the severity. And again, the definition of care is an application towards the population. So basically trying to make symptoms, disease management better across the population. A little more formal definition there. Again, quality of life for people suffering from serious illness. And I think more and more, especially for this, you guys are a lot more educated than past audiences, um, appropriate sort of at any stage. So there is no longer that, oh, he's not sick enough to see you or not. If you look at our prognostication measures, which are pretty horrible, um, you know, we'll see that most people have been plenty sick and, and could use some help as long as it goes. And again, delivered any time right along with curative treatment, uh, disease modifying treatment, et cetera. So one question we always get, and this is very confusing, this comes along with how, how even in our boarding is, the boards are palliative medicine and hospice, and so the general public often says, um, you know, that they link the two, because again, they're trying to advertise. So if you look at palliative care programs during the community, most come out of hospice organizations with the thought that they want to provide that same level of care, but also when you get sicker, now you can become our hospice patient, which is a, a, a much higher paying uh, source of revenue for them. So we like to think of palliative care as, as the subject matter or the, or the, the, the whole field. And hospice basically is just a, a payer source, a, a medical system within that. So we're sort of all enveloping. And if you can think how we develop, it, a lot of those similar cores of patient-focused care, patient and family as a unit, symptom management, sort of evolved that of the hospice model because people just weren't dying fast enough. <laughs> people were living with chronic illnesses due to medical advancements, aging, et cetera. So just a few words on the hospice just so you can get a, a flavor because a lot of us don't have much experience with this. It's basically a Medicare program, but all insurances pay for it, Medicaid pays for it, and it's pretty much free to patients. Um, it's a Medicare a benefit, that's the same as hospitalization. So you can have patients on hospice see you in the clinic. So one of the big problems in, or, or struggles that patients have is that they get signed on to this benefit and they're told by somebody, you can never come back here again. <laughs> you know, they're like, well, I, this is my life. I come to Metro three times a week for the last 10 years and now I can't ever come back? Correct. <laughs> because we care, all right? Um, you're going to see these people you don't know. They're associated with death and dying. You're going to love it. <laughs> just just sign up. Um, but you can still see them in the clinic. So if they're a heart failure patient, they can still get potentially managed in the heart failure clinic. I see all my oncology hospice patients in my oncology power care clinic as long as they still can get there and as long as they're interested in doing so. Um, but it is not a, uh, uh, an all or nothing sort of thing because you'll see patients, especially if they've been chronically ill, this becomes their social mechanism, this becomes their outlet. 
So to pull those away from patients, they really struggle. It's two 90-day benefits, and then if they still qualify, uh, again, the thought is if your prognosis is six months or less, if the disease goes as expected, you can qualify. So if you get that six months out and you're still having some qualifications, it would be every 60 days afterwards. There's no 24-hour home care service. So most, a lot of patients say, well, I'll sign up if they can take care of me 24 hours a day, um, but it doesn't do that way. Utilization is, is actually up. So about 50% of all Medicare patients when they die are enrolled, but length of stay continues to drop, mainly due to high, high acuity, end-of-life care, ICU stuff, people at the last minute crashing and burning and getting sick and I'm still not being very good at communicating it. And some people say this has even dropped as low as 14 or 15 days for the average length of stay, which is not a lot of time for patients and families um, to get all these benefits. So for you guys that send people home on skilled Medicare, uh, either home care or to a nursing home, you know, to skill someone, they basically have to have a therapy need, all right? They have to have IV antibiotics, and or they have to have a new feeding tube. Those are the only three things that will skill people at a nursing home where they get paid for. No one gets paid for just being sick. No one gets paid for just being, um, not being able to take care of themselves. Um, so at home, they have to be homebound, which is a big killer, you know. Um, and once they become no longer homebound, the skill benefit leaves. The bed leaves, the nurse leaves, any home care needs. There's hospice. The service is much more unlimited. So for 90 days, they have a nurse as many visits as needed. They may not stay more than an hour or two, but you have 24-hour access. Three in the morning, I'm having more pain. Ten at night on a Saturday night, you know, what should I do? Call the nurse, they'll come out. Um, they'll call us if they have questions or concerns. Home health assistance up to five to seven days a week, which is huge. Um, home, any medical equipment, so you don't need to qualify for oxygen. So if you have any of our patients that are going on hospice, they're going to get oxygen without you having to walk them 10 laps when they can't stand up. Um, it's going to come under their service. And again, for a lot of our patients, one of the major drivers of, of their symptoms is, is shortness of breath. Not that oxygen helps it, but if it feeds back on the uh, trigeminal nerve and, and gives the negative feedback into the respiratory center, they'll feel less shortness of breath with that. And so, meanwhile, they can't qualify because uh, we can't get their pulse ox low enough. They can still benefit immensely. And that can present, preserve many emissions. Any medication, a social work, bereavement, chaplain, volunteers, volunteer attorneys, all this help for patient, patients and family. So when people actually come off this sometimes because they're on heart failure, now they're getting insurance, their meds, most patients are quite distressed to come off because all of a sudden all their help is gone. So they're a little scared to get on it, but when they're on it, they're like, this, this is awesome. <laughs> so a little bit about just sort of, we'll digress, on medicine. So Eric Cassell is, I think he's now up at Yale. He's a medical internist and ethicist. So basically he talks about our twin obligations as docs, right? So relief of suffering and cure of disease when we can, twin obligations of a profession that's dedicated to the care of the sick. The last sentence is, pretty important to me at least, so if we don't understand the nature of suffering, oops, it's a minute slide, interventions that though they may be technically adequate, may actually not only relieve suffering, but cause more suffering. So you all have seen this, you know, why did you get the heart calf that led to your dissected aorta, that led to your vegetative state? Well, I don't know, I just thought I would ask for one, <laughs> and someone does it, or whatever the intervention may be. Again, benefit versus burden. Anytime you guys send a test, anytime you guys send through a procedure to a consult, benefit versus burden. Um, it takes a lot of a lot more higher level of thinking than, well, let me just send it anyways or do it anyway. Patients perceive doing as caring. Okay, it's kind of a uh, so it's it's tough. They'll say, oh my God, that doc was amazing. He's ran me through 18 tests. <laughs> Only cost me five thousand dollars. This is if you're watching the Browns game yesterday. This would be would have been nice. So a little bit about sort of you know United States right now. Don't want to unplug me and 
This screen is dated by the fact that this large thing in the back, that's called a television, all right? <laughs> that will not hang over your fireplace very nicely. So. so one of the problems we have is we're just not very trained well to do these things. So as docs, we don't do anything well that we're not trained to do. You know, I'm not a good thoracic surgeon. Sorry. I can open you up, probably, <laughs> and then I'll hand it off to somebody else and say, oh, you know, got paged. <laughs> It'd be pretty ugly. Because again, so this is a nice, this is actually a real, a real quote came from a doc saying, you know, honest sign out, you know, the nothing to do, you know, code status first, right? And then what has to be done that night for the patient. And sometimes some sign out about what to do if something happens, but usually it's just oh, nothing to do, you'll be fine. And then, as you guys know, sometimes there is something to do. So nothing to do, young guy at end stage, restless, short of breath, he couldn't talk, terrified, I didn't know what to do. So I sort of patted him on the shoulder, said something in inane, and left. And I think most of us can probably see ourselves in this position many times. If not now, then you will in the future. Um, whether it's medicine, whether it's relationships, whatever it may be. But it's a bad feeling. We don't know what to do with these people. We don't even know what to say because some of us aren't even trained to do that. So we just kind of don't even share space with them. We just sort of leave. It's like, you know, when you guys say, I'll be right back to the patient, and you never go back. Anyone done that before? I have. All right. We have two of us. <laughs> Maybe I forgot. But again, like, you don't know how to end the encounter. I'll be right back. <laughs> Not going to happen. 7 a.m. he died. His memory haunts me because he failed to care for him because he was, this doc felt that he was ignorant. So these are a couple of slides just describing a little bit of where we are, how we got there, and really it's just to know a little bit of, of how things have changed so much in this short period of time. So I trained here at Metro from 94 to 97, chief in 98, um, and we didn't have this whole thing about palliative care or even anything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was pretty much pedal to the metal, whatever it was, until they were agonal or <laughs> unresponsive, and someone said, you know, this isn't going well. There's no staff around. You're like, really? Yeah. Maybe we should call hospice. <laughs> and they'd come in, and four hours later, the patient would be gone. You're like, wow, that was awesome. <laughs> but we didn't recognize that people were sick all along the way or opportunity. So it's pretty much one or the other, one or the other. Um, just didn't understand. And as a result, a lot of patients got some really lousy care. A lot of that is for things like this. You know, we just aren't trained in medical school about the natural history of diseases. It's all about, and there's a lot to learn in four years, right? You know? So heart failure, okay, systolic and diastolic, got it, all right. You know, systolic, uh, ischemia, infectious, cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, um, you know, Chagas disease, HIV, you go down your list, okay, got that. Diastolic, tell me about you know, hypertensive, blah, blah, blah. And then the drugs, oh my God, so much to learn, what's A and B and C. And, but no one really says, okay, you know, this disease, it's a five to seven, maybe a seven to nine year illness. It's a terminal illness. Congestive heart failure, it's a terminal illness. When's the last time you told your patient, hey, your EF's 30%, that's why you can't breathe. Don't worry, you're on your diuretic, you're doing better. No one's explaining, hey, this, this is going to be something you're going to be with for a long time if I can't reverse it. Um, so we don't really understand how to tell people that. And we don't really understand how to treat it, and the books don't necessarily help us either. Um, there's a couple of disease, major disease trajectory curves. This is your cancer curve. So most patients with cancer lose 70% of their strength in the last three months of life. They do pretty well, pretty well, pretty well, so they kind of fall apart. So you'll see this in your own families, on the wards, and you guys are meeting people all day long that have advanced metastatic disease that you guys at 3 in the morning are, are telling them about because you're finding it on scans and exam. And that's kind of the nice part about working at a place like this is you get to walk in a lot of people, six thousand that no one's touched despite living miles from health care. Um, so this is bad, right? You need a good performance status to improve. The oncologists need a much higher performance status to treat them. So they struggle. This one you're much more familiar with, the heart failure COPD model, right? Bad COPD, 
your staff comes around, they're not in the room. Well, they used to be down smoking. Now they have to walk. <laughs> you have to, they have to walk down two garages to smoke. Um, and then you're wondering if we should do a pulse ox on them. <laughs> we just walked 400 feet. <laughs> they go smoke. Same thing, heart failure. You know, he's bag of chips. By the time we get to here, they're eating their chips from the cafeteria. But any one of these exacerbations, that patient could die. They're that sick that they could kind of crump and, and get sick. So a lot of this is just trying to say, how do you get patients through there? If you pound them too much about, oh, you're so sick you could die, they're like, well, they've said that four times this last six months. Still here. I don't want to hear about it. And then you have your debility curve, sort of your, your dementia curves, which is a large growing portion, sometimes in vascular dementia, vascular diseases, ALS, things like that, chronic progressive losses. So just knowing that there's, every disease has its own sort of curvature or course can be helpful. We looked at it now more as a little more of a progression. You know, as a disease goes on, everybody is doing more stuff that's palliative. That's not going to be able to cure or fix it. So was adjusting diuretics, et cetera, we're going to be doing more and more stuff to try to modify the symptoms and less on the disease. And it may be even episodic, so another sort of curvature. It may be a lot of palliative care up front. It may be with flares. And then obviously as the disease rapidly progresses, more and more of our stuff. So lots of interventions where we can sort of interplay with people. This may be a diagnosis, getting bad news. This may be at the start of a, of a potential terminal trajectory, whether it's advanced cancer, et cetera. So lots of opportunities where all of us, not just uh, someone who's boarded, has an opportunity to provide this care. And then we look at you know, our training and what we're used to, and then we also look at you know, patients and, and, and modern health care. So obviously, the modern health care and in the world, you know, death is, is the ultimate enemy. No one sh should ever die. <laughs> well, I just gave a talk this morning on prognostication, and guess how many people are going to die in the next 100 years? Seven billion people. That's a lot of space to take up. Don't you think if we bury them all? Where do you put seven billion people? I mean, recycling is trouble in Canada and China. Landfills are full. That's crazy. I don't agree with the babies in the, uh, did you read about that? The Detroit uh, funeral home. They found babies in the ceiling like the, yeah, it was kind of crazy. Anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, so if, if that's going to be the focus of health, which has become over the last 20 years, we will lose this battle. We already are losing. Healthcare is dysfunctional. Patients aren't necessarily getting what they want. They're struggling with communication. Lots of issues that, that we're trying to fix slowly. But if this is a target, death, life at all costs, it's going to be a struggle. It's a no win. It's a prophecy you can't win. My own thought again suffering, disability, loss of independence should be our goals, better communication. We talk a lot now about trying to establish values and goals of care, which are important, but there's kind of tough words to go in a room and say, hey, I've never met you. What are your goals of care? And they look at you like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Get out of here. Um, so again, how do you have verbiage to say, what's important to you? What do you understand about your illness? What have the docs told you? That's the best line. Because what do patients want? Patients want, these, are, these haven't changed in 20 years. So they want good pain and symptom management. They don't want to prolong their death or dying. They want a sense of control. The hardest part of being chronically ill is lack of control. It's kind of like being a resident. You know, you guys still are not an overwhelmingly healthy and happy bunch as residents. I mean, you guys are health, health, happy, but it's a tough job, right? Everyone say it's easy? Who says it's easy? It kind of sucks a little bit, you know? I say, you know, be more old school. I'm like, what do you guys got it made? You know, 120 hours here. It was awesome. We got to see everything. <laughs> Led to all sorts of family dysfunction and all sorts of problems. It's great. <laughs> but, um, again, you have no control, right? You think you're going to leave. You get your admission. Oh, my God. No way I'm not up for my sixth admission because, you know, I'm sure David hasn't closed out yet. Sorry, he's already closed or whatever. You have no control. Your senior comes at you. Oh, God. <laughs> Let me not make eye contact and start typing frantically. He's still going to see you and say, hey, here's two more admissions, sorry. Um, same thing for patients. Show up at 8 o'clock for your PET scan. 
come to clinic at 10 o'clock, come back in two days, wait three weeks. No, I can't overbook you. No, the best I can do is six months of a GI appointment. Who's going to wait six months for a GI appointment? I'm going to be dead by then. The system doesn't care. No one even makes a stretch. Say, you know what? That's not acceptable. I'm going to have to find you an appointment. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to do something other than say, you know what? The status quo is, is acceptable. So again, control is huge. Burden on family. Avoiding dependence. Again, elderly people, they don't want to be what? A burden to their loved ones. They don't want to lose all their resources. They want to be treated with dignity and respect. We also know that patients have a lot of pain and symptoms. So these are people that walk in the hospital with a certain score of pain and come out after almost a two-week, one to two-week stay. This is how many of them are still reporting the same level of discomfort. And again, now pain is even more difficult to treat with everything going on in the world as far as stuff. But it goes to show you that even patients that don't necessarily have a a diagnosis you think would be uncomfortable, you know, heart failure and COPD may have significant discomfort that if we don't ask, we may not find out about. We talked a little about advanced directives and prognostication, and good prognostication can lead to hopefully better planning. We'll talk about that some. We also know that not talking about these things is, is, is not so great. So again, about half of all DNR orders written in the last two days of life not unreasonable to a certain extent. Um, however, again, think of the value, utility, this therapy. Think what this does to the general public. So the general public is pretty smart. Um, so when you guys call and say, you know, I need a family meeting, what do you get on the other line? What do patients say to you or their family? They say, cool, I'll be right in. Or they say, why? Or they don't show up, right? Because you don't say, hey, come on in. I've got great news to tell you. <laughs> you know? Your pneumonia is getting better. Well, so we've, they learned that if I ask to see a bunch of family members, it's bad news. How do we avoid bad news in life? We try to ignore it. Stay at work. Stay at late. <laughs> don't go to see the doctor. Things like that. Same thing here. If we write all these DNA orders in the end of life, the take-home message of families is, my, your loved one becomes DNR, they will be dead soon. That's the layperson's potential take-home. So just think about that, not to say that we can necessarily stop all these, but that's potentially when patients give you pushback, that may be why. If you do this, I'm gonna, you, my mom's going to be gone, or my brother's going to be gone. I don't want that. Well, we don't want that either, but Let's talk about what's, what's the care that's going to be helpful. Large amount of people spend time in the ICU, and again, significant suffering along the way. I'm going to skip that. This is my, uh, again, a good geriatric and a power care uh, thing. If everybody wants to live longer, how do I stop the aging process? The Wizard of Id says, what disease do you want? So it's pretty good. What we talk about, we have an aging population. So by 2030, which seemed like a long time ago, 9 million people are over the age of 85. In Cleveland, which is Cuyahoga County, the oldest county in Ohio, it's, it's going to be about 35 to 40,000 people over the age of 85 in this county. That's a lot of people. There's like 10 geriatricians, so we're going to need a little help. <laughs> All right? It's a lot of people in hospitals, and that may be by 2030 or by 2040. We already know that baby boomers are asking for things that the, the greatest generation didn't ask for, so that was always nice. But again, it's more pressures. We know caregivers. I mean, how many of us live in the same city where our parents are? Most of us don't. All right, we move for jobs, for training, et cetera. Who's going to go back and care for them when they get sick? That's rhetorical. You guys can answer. Who's going to help take care of my mom? Any of you guys? <laughs> I'm looking for some help. I have a sister who is, who's financially not able to get out of Cincinnati <laughs> due to her work. Or it's going to be the person who's staying at home who has disabilities themselves. You know, you guys have all seen the, the son who comes in to watch their mom and dad who's 65 and they're 90. Unfortunately, that's not may not always be the most able-bodied, financially responsible person because he's needed to stay at home for all those years. 
So a huge problem, I mean, we haven't even talked about this in the whole healthcare finance system. So if you like prognostication, you can use age. So if you're not comfortable giving prognostication, you can just use simple age. So this is probably a little bit different in 2020, but not a whole lot. So if you make it to 80, you get about another nine years on average. If you make it to 85, it's about seven more years on average. So 50% will make, if you make 65, that'll get you done at about 83. So patients say, oh, how long do I have? You can say, well, how old are you? <laughs> and give them some simple data and then adjust it back based on their, uh, based on their uh, medical illnesses. This kind of goes against like that first line where I talked about an intervention, while it may be appropriate, may have unintended consequences. So I am a huge proponent of seatbelts, <laughs> uh, but this is from a friend of mine, Jim Hallen, back out in Stanford. Basically, if we prevent some way from dying, that allows something else to happen. Okay, so we as docs don't seem to be very good at recognizing the accumulation of medical problems. You know, great news. You know, you had a heart attack, but I opened up your, uh, you know, your LAD. I also got you right real quick. All things are going to be great. Because now you're going to die of heart failure. Right? I mean, literally, that's, that's how it works. There's no waiver that says that. <laughs> um, but it's a good thing. I'm not I'm being facetious, but hey, that's fantastic. You did not have sudden cardiac death. We averted that. But you do have significant medical problems you may have an outcome because you had an MI and a significant problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is probably going to be your progressive pathway for the future. I don't say all that in the first post-op visit, but it's a way of saying, what do you understand that there are problems with this? And this is kind of like the Wizard of Id. What disease can I get? The medical tools can be suffering. And again, we have not taken any sort of responsibility in the medical field for this. What's the newest invention? What's the best thing we can do? You know, now they're putting LVADs in people without destination therapy. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know. If I can get six months and be at home for part of it and have an artificial heart, maybe not a bad thing. But what next? What next? Who's going to take care of it? What happens after those consequences? They all end up getting embolic phenomena. So again, the, the, the thrust to get people to live longer at all costs, there's no backup plan, right? There's no parachute. It's just sort of, well, huh, seemed like a good idea. So what's our role here? So these are things that, that you guys hopefully already, we can help you out with. Um, so symptom management. Hopefully the biggest thing we can teach you guys is primary palliative care. No different than, you know, diabetes management, hypertension. You know, what are some simple sort of pain management rules? What are some nausea rules? How to have some simple conversations? What do you understand about your illness? How to have a, a, an advanced director discussion without totally fumbling it up? Um, how to even just simply ask? You know, do you have this paperwork? What does it mean to you? So we're happy to help with this. So again, we'll help you with symptoms. Family meetings, we'd prefer not to be the only people there, but we will be there whenever. Um, I use hope for the plan, I hope for the best plan for the worst all the, all the time. It's a great, easy, cheesy line, but it allows patients to know, hey, things are pretty sick. We're hopeful we can do this X, Y, and Z, but we may not be able to. Advanced directives, prognostication, we're happy to do it. I think we often do it more scientifically and less gestaltly than, than even a lot of the subspecialists may do because it's, it's just too close to them sometimes. We do know that the better the relationship between, the, between a provider and a patient, the harder it is to prognosticate. So I can see someone on the wards and say, oh, two to three weeks, four days, week and a half. My own patient, I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's hard really how to say, you know, it could be any time. I mean, only God knows. I mean, you can go all the, all the euphemisms we do. It's hard when someone you've known for 15 years is looking at you saying, don't give me bad news. We'll look at hospice referrals, assess spiritual needs, psychological needs, support the families, and we talked about education, and we're happy to help out with any end of life care. Often we'll become the hospice doctor records for all these patients, so um, because we have 24-7 access, 
um, to us as well. This is a trivia question now. I should have had the picture. Keith Richards, you guys know who Keith Richards is? God, you guys are see. Rolling Stones, all right. If you guys were all 50, we'd be killing it right now, right, Julie? All right. So Keith Richards looks like he's been dead for 20 years. He's the Jack Sparrow, the character for, uh, he's the guy that they role model his face off of. So <laughs> gives you a thing. Anyways, it's a great line. I'll just laugh at myself. Like usual. <laughs> so this is, uh, these are actually some, you know, and these are sort of earlier in our inception, but, but cases I think we all can sort of get a feeling for. Um, these are real patients that I took care of. Uh, so again, Sue was a middle-aged woman, admitted to the hospital with anasarca. She had ovarian cancer. You know, we, she codes her as soon as she gets to the, to the floor, goes to the ICU. Um, even on transfer to the ICU, the family's called, said, hey, she went to the ICU after she arrested. Still no family shows up. And unfortunately, she dies soon thereafter. And the, and the thing that was so ironic is that, I mean, the family's obviously upset. And again, maybe because she didn't tell them, but, you know, no idea how sick she was. We had known, no idea. How, when, how did that happen? And you look at her record, you're like, well, she's had this for eight years. Um, Olga's another one. Uh, she wants everything done. So if there's anything you can take out of our lectures here is please pull this out of your vocabulary. Okay? Think of going to a retail shop and you asking, do you want every they ask you, do you want everything done? Oh well, yes. Well, that will be fourteen thousand dollars. <laughs> or you go to take your car in. Who says fix everything you want to fix on that car? <laughs> right? You'll be broke. And your car still won't work. So take this out. No one knows what this means. It's a euphemism. It, 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 do you want the best care possible we can do for your loved one? Who says no to that, number one? But again, everything. They want everything. How do, what do patients want? What do they know they want? I mean, when you're treating some hypertension, do you say, do you want everything for hypertension? So I can give you every drug you want. <laughs> it's taking a while to put an Epic. I'll probably put it wrong, send to the wrong pharmacy. <laughs> but don't worry about it. So pull that out. Do you want everything? You know, what do you understand? Your loved one's sick. Here's what we can do. What, which of these things do you feel would be most appropriate for your loved one? What would she say if she's that physician? Has she talked about if she was sick, what, what would be appropriate for her? What would, what would mimic her values or her goals, et cetera? But this is a setup because then someone has to come in and say, you know what, now we cannot do everything, whatever that may be. You know, I want an OxyContin. That's part of everything, right? No one gets that. Not anymore. So, again, everything done. Comes to another hospital, transferred to Metro, codes intubated, dies in the ICU. So, again, had a terminal illness at another hospital. Actually came to Metro because at that time we had a, a, a different logo. What's our current logo? Oh, that's right. It's on the change is everything. Change is just the beginning or, yeah, I thought on the bus. Um, Friend of mine's face was on the bus for a while, Dave Coons. So that's pretty funny. Uh, got a big head. Um, at this time, the logo was Hopes and Miracles. So when I asked that, I said, you know, what, what brought, what made you transfer? And the husband said, I, we brought her for the miracle. So, I mean, talk about a hard line to come up with <laughs> to respond to that. I said, well. The miracle maybe is that, you know, she got taken care of. The miracle is we can support you through this, but it was a hard, be careful of logos. Pat wants treatment. Um, hospice is kind of with the hospital staff and husband feel, or the hospital staff, husband feels that they're pushing into services. Actually, as this is a, a, a gynonc patient from years ago, as she's getting his, her first round of chemo, she codes and dies, or she dies, not necessarily codes. Um, very difficult. Here's a woman, um, maybe a little better sort of hopefully plan of, of kind of integration of, of palliative care, integration of sort of maybe goal setting and, and directive through the whole course. This is a woman named Betty. She had a metastatic cervical cancer, about 48. She had a 12-year-old son. She was unemployed. She was single or divorced. And at presentation to our service was obviously quite ill. 
metastasis to many organs. She's on second line treatment. Of course, she gets a big PE. She's admitted for that. We see her while she's here. And I'm following her in the clinic for this as well. Chemotherapy. She gets remitted for some complications there. A month later, disease progression. Two months later, she gets a pneumothorax due to one of her pleural mets advancing. Um, she comes in, gets a chest tube for that. And then, uh, actually, we haven't even seen her by this time. And then we get consulted there because on the day of discharge, she's complaining about pain, and they don't want to give her any medication to go home with. Um, so probably someone who's been fairly sick along the way. <laughs> Not uncommon. And this can be a heart failure patient, a CPD patient. doesn't have to be a gynoc patient. Um, but again, what were the challenges? The biggest part was Betty did not feel like she was part of this team. I did not feel like I was part of any decision making, she said. People don't ask me who I want to see, just tell me what patient what doc I should see and why. She's scared to death of medications. She has no insurance. This is before the Affordable Care Act, so she has no access to Medicare, Medicaid. She had a child she was trying to raise, get to school despite her being sick, so she had, you know, try to work around scheduling to get people to school, get people bum rides, et cetera. She lived out of county in Lorain County, it's about 40 miles away. No one would tell her what's going on. She had no understanding of her prognosis. And she said, you know what, I'm scared to death. Um, well, I'm afraid to tell you what's going to happen, especially to my family, because I am everything to my son. I've got to take care of him. So really, she wasn't even able to express any of her fears, or any of her concerns. And there's lots of challenges. So with us as docs, you know, why is it hard to kind of refer or have us things? Well, one is, you know, we don't know what can or can't be done. We're not, you know, not everybody can be an expert on symptom management. You know, we clearly struggle with communication, clearly struggle with prognostication. Um, interventions, as you know, are very quick and focused. Now we have hospitalists, we have outpatient, inpatient, they're not coordinated. You guys have a follow-up clinic. So again, now it's the third doc they've seen in the admission. Still, everyone's a different doc. You know, who's going to lean into the problem? Who's going to take responsibility for following that test? If you can do it as a team, that's great. But the patients, I don't think they see that as a team. They're like, another doc? i got to tell my story again? It's exhausting. Um, some of it's access, some of it's systems. It's a hard one to solve. Um, hot potato syndrome, I love that one. David, you tell him she's sick. No, Eric, you tell him. You're the primary care doc. You know him so well. I know you haven't seen him in six months. But you're the oncologist. You're the nephrologist. You know dialysis. Well, I'm kind of busy. Well, I'm busy. I'm busier. I'm busy. <laughs> so no one tells the patient. And, and so as a result, this responsibility, I'll tell you next time. We'll have a conversation next time. It goes on and on. Where does it end? Any of you guys want to be intensivists? Ends in the ICU often. I mean, who are some of your best communicators? The ICU docs. Who should be the worst? ICU docs. The patients are intubated, right? <laughs> like anesthesia. Don't talk to anybody. You're going to bed now. Good night. <laughs> Again, but they have lots and lots of practice at people in severe illness. And that's great that they're good at it, but along the way, they're often saying, this patient's been sick for a year. So there was a thing, uh, even back in 1995, American College Physicians put out a call for having more of these discussions, whether it's end of life, whether it's advanced therapy, saying, if you're surprised, look at your patient, if you think, would you be surprised if they were dead in a year? And if you came out and said, wow, I, I would not be, Someone needs to have a conversation with that patient. I guarantee you, patients have no idea. All right? Because they're thinking, wow, if it's important, the doc would have brought it up. 9,600 patients said, I'm willing to talk about my health and prognosis and life, but I don't want to bring it up. If it's that important, the doc should be telling me. They should be bringing it up. And it's hard. If we're not trained, time, we may be wrong, right? We don't want that. From our things, again, you know, we're learning things about hospice and the overlap. We're talking about, you know, here's this one year thing we talked about. The same struggle that patients have with encounters, we have too. How can I see these patients quickly? How can I chart? 
Think of the first three months you guys are all interns. Who learned about diabetes in the clinic? No one did. It's how do I get this chart closed? This alarm button keeps going up. And then what's this pharmacy button? Oh, they changed it three months ago. And think about it, the whole month is how to get Epic to work. It's frustrating, especially as, a, as an educator, like, hello, hypertension, listen to me. Be quiet, I'm typing. <laughs> no, it's crazy. For patients, we talked about some of these benefits. We, our thought of we can help people navigate a system, we can give them some empowerment, we can relieve some symptoms. We know that if we can relieve patients and symptoms, we can improve, improve performance status. I improve your performance status, your access to treatments increases. Um, so that's another sort of a big value. We can do both suffering uh, palliation as well as treatment modifying, support for families and caregivers, because again, that's often left out is the family members. Now, with HIPAA, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's, you'd be surprised how many patients and families says, you know, no one's talking to me. You know, well, you're, I can't talk to you until you take her home, and then you're in charge of all the home care. <laughs> well, we can't tell you anything until that time. It's kind of crazy. So if you look at the, the, the private sector, so if you go to a, a private hospital, if you train, what do you see at the bottom of every note? Daughter called. Husband notified. Son updated every single day because one, that's who sues them, so they're trying to protect themselves. Two, that's part of good medicine and communication because you're going to take care of this patient in two days. You need to know that they're going to be going home in two days. Here, we're not very good at it. I haven't really improved that much um, in a long time, unfortunately. So, for the providers, what's in it for us to sort of talk about it? Well, we can hopefully save time, a little more efficient in these meetings, but also if we can have some of these conversations up front on the second admission instead of the fifth, maybe that can be helpful. I think we're seeing earlier and earlier consults. Um, you're never going to say the consult is too early. We're happy to sort of dive in. Because if you're, if you're able to get in the hospital these days, you're pretty darn sick. All right? You guys may not think that when you see people come to your floor, but in 20 years, the, the complexity and the acuity is incredible. We can manage them symptoms, advanced directives, prognostication. Um, and again, there's lots of stuff from a, from a hospital happiness, patient satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, hopefully, we can teach the next generation of healthcare providers, which is you guys. Isn't that exciting? The next generation. I'm never going to get sick now. <laughs> it's crazy. Staff benefits for the staff, huge benefit for the staff, again, education wise. This data showing improved job satisfaction. And again, the, the whole thought of humanism in, in, in medicine is a whole thought of which I can a whole other talk for me. That talks really about me, David. It a, a, keep, makes me happy. But again, we're losing the humanism. So 100 years ago, 150 years ago, you were a doc, what did you have? You carried a leather bag, right? In that bag you had what? About three things. A saw. Um, probably some suture, tincture of opium, you know, and that's about it. And, and docs did really well, and they got a lot of corn and chickens and stuff in kind. But what did they do? They spent time, they're at the bedside. They were there when people needed them, you know, at the home, et cetera. Uh, obviously, we have a little more options, a little more time demands now, but the thought is to not lose that aspect, which is so easy to do when you say, you know what, I'll be right back, and you never come back. Or when you don't, someone dies and no one really talks about it. No one sends a thank you note. No one sends a thank you note. Condolence note. <laughs> send thank you notes to when you get gifts. How about that? Crazy thought. <laughs> You'll get more gifts if you send a thank you note. Just a tip as a giver, all right? <laughs> so again, try not to sort of lose that and why we're all here, which is huge. And it's easy to do. You're exhausted, you're tired, you're crabby, and people are trying to pound this out of you, unfortunately. So there's a little bit about Betty. So as we saw, she looked pretty sick before that. Uh, but we took care of her for about another whew, six months. So I actually got her out that same day, just with some medications, got her pain a little bit better. She was having some disease-related, neoplastic-related fatigue. So we're on some psychostimulants for some additional energy because she was struggling getting to treatments. 
you don't show up for treatments, you can't get, hopefully, disease-modifying and, and prolonging treatment. Unfortunately, though, a couple months later, disease progression, but performance status continued to improve. Um, she, we also got her some home care, got her uh, a social worker, got some communicate, uh, transportation, so she's able to get more treatment. Every two weeks, she's in the oncology clinic with the gynecologist for information and management. Still getting sicker, though. She's admitted. And from January, she's too weak to go home because she has no family there. And she dies in a host inpatient hospital facility surrounded by staff that became her surrogate sort of family and her son, which is pretty good. So, so what were the benefits? And for some of us, very simple. You know, provider of the community of care. We were able to sort of look into what services we could get, got some out there. For her, the biggest thing was performance status, because her goal was, I want to live as long as I can for my son, as long as I can be communicative, talk to him. That means I have to make appointments, I have to have enough energy to care for him, I have to stay awake, things such as that. She got more treatment. We probably got her four more months of treatment. Whether that helped her in the long run, hopefully. But that's what was important to her, that was part of her goals. So she's able to get more chemotherapy. We were able to meet her son. I think she had a mother as well, who then we could start sort of saying, hey, she's going to need more support from you. And they were able to sort of do that. We were able to tell her what's going on. You know, Betty, I'm sorry. I think you only have maybe another month or two. But how do we work around that? Let's start to prepare for that. Have you talked to your son about that? Who's going to be his, who's going to be his uh, guardian? All these things have to be done before people die. So pay, and people need that. They need warning for that. Even if it's not going to be in a month or two. Hey, you have metastatic cervical cancer. It's not curable. You have a son who's 12. What's the plan? What's the plan? Because they're thinking about it. They just need to be nudged a little bit. Again, she said she set the tone. Her we established what was important to her, and all of her care was to try, try to get her to that point. When it became time for hospice, it was as smooth as we could make it. Um, and then obviously the hospice team was fantastic in managing her. So just the last couple of take homes. So again, we're here to relieve suffering, quality of life. Really, the same thing that every doc is here for. All right. I mean, it's kind of interesting. You think about that line. It's like, well, I don't own this. It's kind of what the profession was. Um, or you could say, you know, I'm here to see, you know, cool computer images on three-dimensional TVs. In a dark room, you could be a radiologist, and that's 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 also is fine. We need radiologists, but you know, when they were six or seven, so I want to be a doc. They probably weren't thinking, I got to be a radiologist. <laughs> Seriously, dermatology, I love it at four. It's amazing. <laughs> they have the best bags. It's so cool. So it's awesome. Many diagnoses. So we see a wide range of patients, generally serious or life-threatening illnesses. Again, trying to seek out patient and family. What do they respect? What are their wishes? What do they understand? Patient understanding is the key for all this stuff. Anyone who's around with us, we talk about, you know, the, and if someone gets sick, you guys are being told, what's the code status? Get a code status. What, what do I do? Just go in there and get a code status. I can get, I can get a full code if you want for me. <laughs> do you want me to search your heart? No? Oh. Um, but again, you can't have a co-status discussion because what happens? Patients say, why are you asking me this? They need to frame it. So you guys are all supposed to give, when patients have new admissions, you're supposed to ask them about advanced directives, right? You have a 30-year-old with diabetic with cellulitis of his foot, otherwise pretty healthy. Well, I have to talk to you about your advanced directive. You know, have you ever thought about if you're in a terminal situation, not going to be surviving this, what, what would be important to you? And they're looking at you saying what? Why are you asking me this? Am I gonna, am I gonna die? Oh no! Oh, I don't want to talk about it then. <laughs> but if you say, well, yeah, you very well could, or you're sick enough too, then we can have that conversation. So they have to know their di their prognosis to have that to frame that conversation easier. So we tend to get right to the point and kind of miss the uh, the landing in there. Again, early in the course. That's, that's, not so much a problem anymore. Um, a good example for this is, 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 you know, we have a pretty active three to four half days a week in the oncology clinic. 
And we're seeing pretty much most of all stage for lung cancer, which now is becoming a little more of a chronic illness with potential immunotherapy, advanced GI malignancies. And it's being seen as, as we've been indoctrinated there for three words. It's, it's not scary, you know. Patients don't come in going, you know, don't touch me. <laughs> oh, I'm mean, like, no syringe here, you're safe. Come on in. So hey, before it'd be on the wards. So when we first started our service in 2002, so I was go up on the floors, maybe Greg was in the uh, walk on the floors, and people have, and maybe one of their cars, these have cars in the day, going, which one of my patients is super sick? Because Harrington's here. Okay, we'll be able to we're going to try to work, work with you as a team. Not about all death and dying, uh, which is kind of refreshing. It's interdisciplinary, and again, we're trying to be hit all spheres of patients' health care. So I'm actually going to stop on this slide because um, there's more mainly just on when and where to to go. But again, from a from a general medicine perspective, this is sort of a, a good start of not just people who have advanced sort of metastatic cancers or we think this is the end of life care, but almost sort of functional syndromes to think about. Where clearly, if you look at these people, they may have a, a year or less to live. Um, so those are folks that may be getting an opinion or at least seven sort of a third, a third look, outside look, say, okay, is this appropriate or not? What, where can we help? Even if it's just sort of identifying who's the spokesperson, even if it's just sort of saying, you know what, you know, what, is it, what did Dr. Soma tell you about your health? Or do you, what, you know, that's a nice way to sort of start conversations. And sometimes it's a lot easier because, you know, I, I have no skin in the game. I'm not in charge of when you get admitted or discharged. You know, we'll just kind of sit down and try to talk a little bit. So a little bit about just sort of what the field is, kind of where it's come up the last 20 years or so, some indications, and then in the future we can talk more about some details of syndromes. So questions or concerns, comments? Counseling needed, anything? No? All right, thank you very much.